Jonathan Aldati will be in when it's, um, he's finished everything that Jonathan does. Thank you all for coming. We'll start with uh, the word of prayer. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be always acceptable to you. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Thank you all for coming. I'm actually going to get back to Acts, honestly. Um, if you want to turn to Acts 2, I'm going to use a completely different Bible today, so all the pages are sticking together. It's a brand new one, so it's going to take me ages to find most things. What did you buy? Uh, the Net Bible, New English Translation. I bought it mainly for the notes. If you look at it, that's how much Bible reading there is. All the rest of that is translation notes. Only just. <coughs> anyway, we're going to Acts 2, um, 37 to 47. So this is after Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. Now when they heard this, they were acutely distressed and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, What should we do, brothers? Peter said to them, Repent, each one of you, and be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the promise is for your children and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord your God, our God will call to himself. With, the, with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Save yourself from this perverse generation. So those who accepted his message and were baptised that day were about 3,000 people were added. Pretty good for a first sermon. They were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to breaking of bread and to prayer. Reverential awe came over everybody and many wonders and miraculous signs came about by the apostles. All who believed were together and held everything in common. They began selling their property and possessions and distributing their proceeds to everybody as anyone had need. Every day they were continued to gather together by common consent in the <coughs> temple courts, breaking of bread from house to house, sharing their food with gladness and humble hearts praising God and having good will for all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number every day those who were being saved. Sounds like a pretty good church. This is often held up as what the church, it's the, the, the basic, the seed of what the church should be. And throughout history, every time the organised church becomes more and more corrupt, people go back to this passage and try to start anew. You think even the, the, the monastery movement, they had to all, all things together, they sold all their possessions, they came and they lived together and they worshipped together. Even that's going back to this. And when you get the, the corruption of the Catholic Church, the, the Protestants went back to this. Then the nonconformists went back to this. So the more corrupt the church gets, the more we go back to this. This is not necessarily the ideal church. They were all busy selling all their property. There was reasons for that we'll go into later on. They did end up impoverished with nothing to support themselves. That's not just because they sold everything, but that's also because they were being victimised by the Jewish society of the time. Um, but this I want to look at, and there's, there's four things in there I want to look at. So if you look at verse 20, uh, 42, they were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, and to breaking of bread, and to prayer. There are four things. And I want to look at all those four things, but if it doesn't take me four or five weeks, or four or five different sessions to do it, I'd be amazed. We're just going to look at the first one today, the apostles devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. And I want to look at each one of these, and see how a church should work from, from this. First teaching in the Bible. When's the first time teaching is mentioned in the Bible? There's a clue on your notes. Exodus. Exodus. Very well done. It's always Exodus or Genesis or Exodus. Let's go to Exodus. A story you will know well. So Exodus uh, 4. Verse 
one mutinous Moses who didn't want to do anything. He preferred hiding at the back of a, a desert. So uh, Exodus chapter 4 verses 1 to 12. Moses answered, he's talking to the burning bush here again, and if they do not believe me or pay attention to me, but say, the Lord has not appeared to you, the Lord said to him, this, um, what is that in your hand? And he said, a staff. And the Lord said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a snake. And Moses ran from it. And the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and grab it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it. And it became a staff in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord your God, uh, the, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. The Lord also said this, put your hand into your robe. So he put his hand into his robe and he brought it out. And it was leprous. His hand was leprous like snow. He said, put it back in your robe. So he put it back in his robe and brought it out from his robe and it was restored like the rest of his skin. If they do not believe you or pay attention to the former signs, then they may believe the latter sign. And if they do not believe even these two signs or listen to you, then take um, some water from the Nile and pour it on the ground and the water you take from the Nile will become blood on the dry ground. Then Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not an eloquent man, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. The Lord said to him, Who gave a mouth to man? And who makes a, mute, a person mute or a deaf person seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? So now, go, and I will be with your mouth and will teach you what you must say. So here's the first mention of the word teaching in the Bible. I will be in your mouth and I will teach you. Let's go to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 5. I'll read the first set while, uh, while you're all eating still. <coughs> Here's Moses talking to the second generation, effectively, of Israel um, before they go into the Promised Land. So it's uh, verse 22 to 20, uh, 30 to 33. The Lord said these things to your entire, entire assembly. Here, Moses is talking about the giving of the Ten Commandments. He'd gone up into the Mount of Sinai. God had come down on it. Then God told him to come back down to the people. And as soon as Moses was back down with the people, then God spoke. So where we see Charlton Heston up a mountain with the, the finger of God writing on the stones... It actually didn't happen like that. <laughs> Moses came down the mountain and then God spoke. So, uh, so I'll start going to into And the Lord said these things to the entire assembly at the mountain um, from the middle of the fire, the cloud and the darkness with a loud voice. Um, and that was all he said. So that's just the Ten Commandments. Then he inscribed the words on two tablets of stone and gave them to me. Then, when you heard the voice from the midst of the darkness, while the mountain was ablaze, your, um, all your tribe of elders, leaders and elders approached me. You said, the Lord our God has shown us his great glory, and we have heard him speak from the middle of the fire. It is now clear to us that God can speak to human beings, and they can keep on living. But now, why should we die because of this intense fire that will consume us? If we keep hearing the voice of the Lord our God, we will die. Who is there from the entire human race who has heard the voice of the living God speaking from the middle of the fire as we have and has lived? You go so you can hear everything the Lord our God is saying and then you can tell us whatever he says and we will pay attention and do it. Then the Lord heard the speaking and said to me, um, and said to me, 
I have heard what these people have said. They have spoken well. That's strange, isn't it? What he means is, yeah, they're right. They can't listen. So what he means is, yeah, they've told the truth. They can't listen. They have spoken well. If only it would really be the desire to hear me and obey all my commandments in the future so that it might go well with them and then their descendants with them and their descendants forever go tell them return to their tents as for you remain here with me so i can declare to you all the commandments statutes ordinances that you are to teach them so that they can carry them out in the land that i am about to give you be careful there Therefore, to do exactly what the Lord your God has commanded you to do. Do not turn to the right or the left. Walk, just as he has commanded you so to do, uh, that you may live, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long, and the land where you are going to possess it. So right from the beginning, there's the idea that God will speak to a man who will then pass that message on to the people. So that's where the idea of teaching comes to start with. It's God's teaching, not man's. And we won't look up the next one. It's the, the, the tent of meeting. What happened is uh, Moses set up, if you like, a, a, a proto-tabernacle, a tent. And he would go to that tent outside the camp of Israel in the desert. And when he went into it, the pillar of uh, fire or cloud would descend in front of it, the Shekinah glory. And everybody would stand outside and go, Hoo! and they would see God and Moses talking. And it said that Moses and God talked face to face, like a man talks to his friend. And then the pillar would rise up again. Moses would come out and tell the people, this is what God says. And the theory was, you've seen that. There's a sign and wonder there. Let's see, signs and wonders. Cross, uh, ten plagues. I mean, forget the putting your hand in and taking it out leprous or snakes or blood, so you've got the ten plagues in Israel, you've then got the division of the Red Sea, um, you've then got the striking of the rock and water comes out, you've got the turning, of the... all these different signs and wonders that proved that Moses was telling the signs from God, that what he was saying, and then the people could physically see it, they could see God coming down and talking to him. Let's go to Exodus 33 though, um, which is actually where we should have been, Exodus 33, there's a difference between Moses and the people though and it's this difference that uh, that is really important to understand so Exodus 33 it's 12 to 23 Moses said to the Lord see you have been saying to me bring this people up but you have not let me know by whom you will send me He's in the desert, he's supposed to take them up to the promised land. The people are being rebellious and stroppy, and Moses wants a bit of backup here, basically. But you said, I know you by name, and you have found favour in my sight. Now, if I have found favour in your sight, show me your way that I may know you, that I may continue to find favour in your sight and see that this nation is your people. And the Lord said to him, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not take us from here. How will it be known then that I have found favour in your sight, I and your people? It is not by your, by your going with us so, um, so that we will be distinguished. I and all your people from all the other peoples who are on the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing also that you have requested. For you have found favour in my sight and then I know you by name. I know you by name. And when Mary Magdalene was at the tomb, how did Jesus call her? By name. I know you by name. And Moses said, show me your glory. And the Lord said to him, 
I will make my goodness pass before you, and I will proclaim the Lord by name before you, and I will be gracious to you, and I will be gracious, and I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. But he added, you cannot see my face, for no one can see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me, and you will station yourself on a rock. And when my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hands, and while I pass by, then I will take my hand away, and you will see my back, but my face you must not see. In one of the Psalms, it says, God showed his deeds to the people of Israel, but he showed his ways to Moses. Moses wanted to know what God was like. He wanted to see God. For, so when you see someone face to face, it talks about seeing a king face to face. It's to know them personally. It's to, to meet them. Um, there's a, a famous preacher called Tozer. I don't know if you've heard of him, A.W. Tozer. Oh, yes. He um, I once heard, and one, the only tape recording I've ever heard of him, he said that God needs people who know him other than by hearsay. He needs people who know him face to face. And that's the difference here. Moses wanted to know. And he didn't want to go anywhere with just a set of instructions. What's the point of a set of instructions if you don't know the person behind those instructions? If you don't know the character? Yeah. Yes, he wanted a relationship. Yeah. He? But given he was the most unwilling one to start with, and yet here's the end up, I, I want to know you better. Beginning, he began to ask God, well, who are you? I don't even know who your name is. And at the end, I want to know who you are. That's the difference here. Stephen, what's the difference though when he, he saw God face to face when he was doing the same commandment? Yeah. But he can't say, yeah. I, th I, I think he saw the glory of God, what's called the Shekinah glory of God. But to physically see God, I mean, we'll come on to that later on. But this, the idea is to physically see God in the state we are now in the state we are now, to see God would kill us. So God had to find a way for us to get to know him without killing us in the process. So this is the idea of teaching here. Um, let's go on to Acts Act 7. This is Stephen, just before he was stoned for preaching far too long. Acts 7. Someone want to read this one for me? This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai and was, who was with our fathers and he received living oracles to pass on to you. So here's Stephen linking up, if you read the whole of the sermon, Linking up Moses with Jesus. The idea of living oracles being passed on to us. So that brings us on to Jesus. And the question is, I've got there, where did Jesus get his teaching from? When Jesus was born, was he utterly intelligent instantly? He knew everything. We have this strange idea, I think, in Christianity that Jesus knew everything straight away. Go to Isaiah. Chapter 7. Um, if someone can read this one for me, because it's a bit weird in my version. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son, and shall call him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in, dread will be deserted. Dread will be deserted? Yeah. It's a funny version. Mm -hmm. The people you are in dread of will be without. Uh, um, yeah. yeah. If you've got one of the older versions, it will say, Behold, a virgin will conceive and give a son. Remember uh, Christmas readings, nine lessons and carols? Yeah. Um, 
I've got the same type of version you've got there. It actually probably means a young maiden. In the context of this, what it means is uh, uh, basically a girl who has not had sex will get pregnant. And in nine months' time, she'll have a baby. And then by the time that child is weaned and then starts to know the difference between good and evil, how long does it take for a child to know the difference between good and evil? Forever. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> Forever, yeah. Um, so, but, but in that sort of time period, those two, the two kings that Israel were in dread of at the time will be destroyed. But, except you've got the name Emmanuel in there, haven't you? And you should call his name Emmanuel. And in the New Testament, that's taken and uh, talk about Jesus, a virgin giving birth to Emmanuel. But it says, before he knows the difference between good and evil. Hold on a minute. So Jesus was born without knowing the difference between good and evil. Is that what it means? And the answer is yes. Jesus was exactly the same as yes. you or I. He, when he was born, same as Adam and Eve, did not know the difference between good and evil. And he had to learn it. He had to be taught it. Now, human babies seem to pick up evil a lot quicker than they pick up good, as far as I can remember. <laughs> a, a habit we continue into to, uh, adulthood. But um, Go to Luke. Go to Luke 2. Jesus at the, the, te the temple when he got lost, or actually his parents lost him, to be entirely precise. And there's a, a little verse that covers nigh on 22 years of Jesus' life. Or, um, 22? I think that's what I think, 20, might be 28. 28 years of Jesus' life, I think. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them, but his mother treasured all these things up in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. He increased, which meant he wasn't perfect to start with, or it wasn't perfect in knowledge to start with. And Jesus yeah. kept increasing. Kept increasing. Kept, he kept increasing. increasing. See, he had to learn. <clears throat> Even Jesus, the Son of God, had to learn, he had to be taught. Back to Isaiah, Isaiah 50. Obviously, he was taught in his Sunday school classes. A Jewish child at that time was, um, for the first five years of their life, they were taught the stories in the Bible. The second, or the, up to the age of 12, they were then started to teach them the Jewish rabbinical understanding of those stories. So they actually spent more time listening to the, the rabbis say what they think than actually listening to the Bible, what it says. Um. Which might explain some of the problems. But did Jesus' understanding come from that? Here's, this is probably Isaiah himself speaking. The sovereign Lord has given me the capacity to be a spokesman. What have you got on that one? Instructed tongue. Instructed tongue. Tongue of a disciple. Tongue of a teacher. Tongue of a teacher. Words of wisdom. Yeah. So that I may know how to help the weary. He wakes me up every morning. So who's waking him up? God is waking him up every morning. He wakes me up every morning. He makes me alert so I can listen attentively as disciples do. The Sovereign Lord has spoken to me clearly and I have not rebelled, I have not turned back. I offered my back to those who attacked, my jaw to those who tore out my beard. I did not hide my face from insulting and spitting. But the Sovereign Lord helped me so I am not humiliated. For that reason I am steadfastly resolved, I will not be put to shame. The one who vindicates me is close by. Who dares to argue with me? Let us confront each other. Who, has a, who, has, who is my accuser? Let him challenge me. Look, the sovereign Lord helps me. Who dares to condemn me? Look, 
all of them who wear out their clothes, a moth will eat, eat, eat away at them. Who among you fears the Lord? Who, obey, who obeys his servants? Whoever walks in deep darkness without light should trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Remember that phrase from somewhere else? Who walks in deep, deep darkness without light in the New Testament? On those who um, darkness, darkness great light. light. Yeah. This, this last verse is a bit weird, verse 11. Look, all of you who start fires and who equip yourself with flaming arrows, walk in the light of your fire you started and among the flaming arrows you ignited. This is what you will receive from me. You will lie down in a place of pain. There's a difference there between the light that God gives and the light that man gives, which is a flaming arrow. Gone. But here's the idea that God is teaching Isaiah, and later on in the New Testament, you've got the idea that God is teaching Jesus morning by morning. So it's not merely what he finds in Sunday school, it's that God wakes up Jesus in the morning. In fact, the Jews look at this and they say this is about the Messiah. This is the God teaching the Messiah. This in their teachings. So here's Jesus being woken up by God early in the morning. We probably wouldn't appreciate that, but God's waking him up early in the morning and say, come outside and let's spend some time together. Let's think about the Bible. Let's think about scripture. So Jesus in the, tab in the synagogues would have listened to what was being read out. He would have listened to sermons. More importantly, he would have learnt the scripture off by heart. We know he learnt the book of Deuteronomy off by heart, at least. And I suspect Jesus knew most of the Bible off by heart, so not all of it. He learnt it. And then he would sit and think about it and God would talk to him and God would teach him. So he started off with nothing and God taught him in the same way he talked to Moses. And Jesus in the same way as Moses, he wanted to know his father. He wanted to know his father. Let's go to John 8. John 8. Uh, have, Matthew, have I missed um, yeah, oh yeah I, uh, I can just tell you what that one is sorry I can tell you what that is that's at the end of the Sermon on the Mount when all the people said who is this guy he's, he's talking like he's got actual authority as opposed to our scribes now the scribes what they would do they would say well I have read in a book that Rabbi so and so said that Rabbi so and so said that Rabbi so and so said this is what this means and a lot of intellectuals they like quoting books and they will quote this person and they will quote that person Jesus didn't do any of that he said this is what the Bible said this is what God means end of story and he said it in such a way that the people go whoa that's different <coughs> it's good to have a learned sermon but it's better to understand it so let us skip now to go straight to John sorry there's probably a whole load I'll miss here I with this one I could have there were so many verses I could have put down here we would never finish um, so John 6, this is Jesus after the... John 8, sorry John 8. <sighs> John 8. I'm, I'm glad you're spotting my deliberate mistakes, well done. So John 8, uh, 12, somebody else can read this then for me. I'm doing badly today. Jesus answered, 
know my father also. These words spake Jesus in the treasury, and he fought in the temple, and no man laid hands on him, <coughs> for his hour was not yet come. Then Jesus again said unto them, unto them I go my way, and you shall seek me, and shall die in your sins. Whither I go, ye cannot come. Then said the Jews, Will he kill himself? Because he said, Whither I go, ye cannot come. And he said unto them, Ye are from beneath, I am from above. Ye are of this world, I am not of this world. I said therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? And Jesus said unto them, Even the same that I said unto you from the beginning, I have many things to say and to judge of you. But he that sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. They understood not that he spake to them the Father. Then Jesus, <coughs> then said Jesus unto them, When you have lifted up, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall you know that I am He, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father has taught me, I speak these things. So here you've got the picture. Yeah. Here you've got the picture. Jesus is sent by his Father. Jesus is the light of the world. Remember Moses with the people saying, we can't go up to God. Jesus is saying to this, well I'm going, you can't come. You can't come into the presence of God. But if you don't listen to what my Father has said, it ain't going to go well. So this connects up to Moses, it connects up to Isaiah with the, the idea of the, the light, giving light. The Pharisees were like those who were shooting arrows, lit arrows, in the middle of the night. So you go, whizz, 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 whizz there goes the light. Where's it going? Not much use. Flip back a page or two to John 6. This is Jesus after the feeding of the 5,000. He's gone over the sea to Capernaum and he's talking to the people in the, um, in the synagogue in Capernaum. So it's John 6, 41. Possibly one of the most misunderstood passages in, in of what Jesus said. Then the Jews who were hostile to Jesus began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down out of heaven. And they said, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus replied, do not complain um, about me one to another. No one can come to me unless the father, has, uh, father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. They will all be taught by God. And everyone who hears and, uh, and learns from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. So here's the idea up in the mountain. You cannot see the face of God. And yet Jesus, he is the one who's seen the face of God. Moses couldn't go all the way and see the face of God, but Jesus could. I tell you sol the solemn truth. The one who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that has come down from heaven so that a person may eat from it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats from this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the, um, for the life of the world is my flesh. Then Jesus, who uh, then sorry, then the Jews who were hostile to Jesus began arguing with one another. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? And Jesus said to them, I tell you the solemn truth: unless you eat my flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in yourself. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have everlasting life and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. 
the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, resides in me and I in him, just as the living Father sent me, and I live because the Father. So the one who consumes me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down out of heaven. It is not like the bread your ancestors ate and then later died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. Pretty, I mean the Catholics would say, oh easy, Eucharist, simple, eat the bread, doesn't matter what you do, doesn't matter what you say, just confess, eat the bread, drink the, drink the wine, boom, you're in. But that's not what it means, is it? No. It can't mean that. It can't mean that. So what does it mean? To a rabbi would actually say to his disciples, you need to eat my words. You have to listen to them and you have to feed on them. It's bread. It, it, you've got to fill your life with it. You heard the expression, you are what you eat. So here's Jesus. And it's not merely my teachings. Listen to my teachings, read my published works. Thank you very much. Pay at, pay at the office on the way out. It's, it's more than that. It's take it into your being. Take these, these words come from God through me to you. Take them into your being. In the same way that Moses said, oh God said, I wish the people would really care. I wish they would know me like Moses does, who wants to know me. He doesn't just want the, the, the signs and wonders. Think of Moses, the signs and wonders prove the word. Think of Jesus, the signs and wonders prove the word. At the Last Supper, one of the disciples said to Jesus, show us the Father and it will be sufficient for us. And he said to him, um, I can't remember which one it was, I think it was Thomas, um, Philip I think, how long have I been with you and you don't know me? If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus' whole life, his whole personality, everything about him showed us what God is like. Go on to the next section. It's a good Sunday school question, and I expect a Sunday school answer. Where did the apostles get their teaching from? Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> Correct. Good. <laughs> Where did they get their teaching from? So here's the apostles that the, the new disciples are dedicating their time. They are listening to the uh, teachings of the apostles. That teaching came through God to Jesus, to the apostles. These weren't guys who had been to the latest theological seminary. They hadn't written all the, uh, read all the latest works and things. Um, in fact, if you look at Acts 7, um, someone want to read that for me? Uh, sorry, sorry, Acts chapter 4, verse 7 to 13. This is Peter and John standing before the, the Sanhedrin, the same group of people that put Jesus to death only a short time before. And they're on trial for daring to having um, healed a, a lame man. Anybody want to read that one for me? It's Acts 4, chapter 7. Sorry. <laughs> no respect, no respect. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power, what name did you do this? Then Peter said, filled with the Holy Spirit to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if, you, if we are called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple and asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it's by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. He is the stone your builders rejected, which has become the capstone. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Mm -hmm. When they saw the courage of Peter John and realised what they were, that they were unschooled and ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Uneducated and I have been with Jesus. So. I use the expression tetragrammaton in the, in the church today. 
Um, tetragrammaton, yes. It's a theological word. No, no, I was, um, I was asked what we were doing in the Sunday school. Yeah. The, um, basically, it was the name of God, so the four letters of God, you, hey, but, hey. And theologians hate things that are straightforward to understand. And uh, God was basically saying then, look, Moses asked him, what God are you? And God said to him, well, I'm the one who actually is, as opposed to the ones who aren't. Uh, I'm that one, okay? Um, and so he had this four-letter word. But theological, theologians hate making life simple. So rather than referring to this word as itself, they called it the tetragrammaton, the four, the four letters of God, to make it more confusing so that people don't understand what they're talking about, so that they can get on and get them, get them doing it, talking about these complicated things without the plebs understanding what they're on about. So Peter and John here were uneducated, and they were just talking the same as Jesus did. They were talking without all the theological claptrap, if you like, straight to the point, straight to the letter of God, the same way God had passed it on to them. Notice it was the Holy Spirit, they were full of the Holy Spirit, Jesus said to the disciples at the, the Last Supper, the Holy Spirit will come to you, he will help you remember things, but he will also teach you other things. Because you're not up to it at the moment. There's more you've got to learn, but you're not up to it yet, I will teach you. And it's interesting, the Apostle Paul, so if you go to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, who was not at the Last Supper, who was not, as far as we know, ever listened to Jesus. So 1 Corinthians, and yet see what he says, very famous passage. For I received, who, wherefore? From the Lord, that which I pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and after he had given thanks, broke it, and said, this is my body broken for you. He didn't receive it from the other apostles, for the other disciples. Or That's from his teacher, no. Well, he wouldn't have known that. Galileo wouldn't have known this. Only the people who were in that Last Supper would have known this. And yet, at some stage, God sat the Apostle Paul down and said, look, this is what I did. It's almost as if God shared, or Jesus shared it with him, personally, through the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so we have the disciples, te the Apostles teaching. And the Apostles, why was a uh, Peter and John in trouble with the Sanhedrin for performing signs and wonders. And what does it say that the signs and wonders followed the apostles, following the preaching of the apostles. So in the same way that Moses was given these, the same way that Jesus was given these, now the apostles are given these. Now last time we talked about apostolic succession, and there are many Christians who think that they then have the right to must do signs and wonders. Except we now actually have all the teaching of the Apostles here. If God wants to do signs and wonders, he will, but it is not automatic. Because the signs and the wonders show that this is true, that was done at that time. Now if you flip over the page, human, I may have done that, is that to affirmation? Affirmation. Have you heard the expression affirmation? It's much in the news nowadays. Um, you must affirm somebody in their belief about themselves. So there's a, um, a chap, a black chap called Felix, who's in trouble with the, the law at the moment. Um, he's in court, second time he's in court. The first time was when he dared to share a Bible verse on a online discussion in his university showing that the, the Bible says that homosexuality is a sin. He was thrown out of university. He had to then take his university to court and he was found in his favour and he finished his course. Then he went for a job, his dream job as a, a, a social worker or whatever to help, help people. He got the highest marks in this particular organisation he went to and they offered him the job because he was black as well, so they could tick that box, they could tick, yes, everything, wonderful, wonderful. Then somebody looked up his history and found out he's a Christian and he believes homosexuality is a sin. And they got him in, you must affirm people in their belief about themselves. You must say, yes, I agree with you. I agree completely, you are all right. And because he wouldn't, 
they refused him the job. And he's back in court again now. So he's court again now, saying, look, my Christianity will not prevent my professionalism treating these people. But you're expecting me to believe and to affirm them. So now we are being asked to affirm that a man is now a woman, if he thinks he is. We have to affirm that a woman is a man. We have to affirm that a child is a kitten. As a teacher got in trouble for that. We have to affirm. In other words, we have to agree with them. Yes, this is the right thing to do. Yeah, you are right. This comes from Freudian psychology. In Freudian psychology, if, they said if someone's depressed, the reason they're depressed is because they're not meeting a standard. So the answer's simple, lower the standard. That, that's how it works. Lower the standard. Your, your standards are too high, lower them. Of course, the problem with humanity is we set ourselves very low standards and fail to meet them most of the time. But this is human affirmation. And there's a problem with that from the point of view of Christianity. There's a number of problems, but lay aside LGBTQ, all that stuff, forget all that. There's a problem. There's a lot of self-help books which say you should look in a mirror in the morning. You're great. You're wonderful. You've got this under control. You know what you're doing. Self-affirmation. Telling ourselves that we're wonderful, telling ourselves that we're in control, telling ourselves that you're right. There's a problem. Go to John. Go to John. Yes, you want to know the problem because you're Christians. People buy these books and they buy them. Yeah. Yeah, that you're wonderful. So they're teaching it in schools. They're, they're, you're it's not about cognitive behaviour therapy, but mm. positive affirmations with it. Yeah. Yes, everything's going to be wonderful, everything's going to work perfectly, you're a good person, you know what you're doing. So John chapter 2 and 23, this is Jesus at the end of, or beginning his ministry when he's first talking to people. Now while Jesus was in Jerusalem at the feast of Passover, many people believed in his name because they saw the miraculous signs he was doing. But Jesus would not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. Mm -hmm. He did not need anyone to testify about man for he knew what was in man. He knew what was in man. Mm -hmm. Go to Romans, Romans 6. There's a lot in Romans. Romans 6 starting at verse 1. This is after um, Paul's spoken about salvation, about believing in faith. This is after salvation. What shall we say then? Shall we rem uh, remain in sin so that grace may increase? Absolutely not. How can we who died to sin live in it? Or do you not know that as many as were baptised into Christ were baptised into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may live a new life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of death, we will certainly also be united in the likeness of his resurrection. We know that our old man was crucified with him, so that the body of sin would no longer dominate us, so that we should no longer be enslaved to sin. For someone who has died has been, has been freed from sin. If we die with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that since Christ has been raised from the dead, he is never going to die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you too should consider yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Jesus Christ. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies, so as to obey its desires. And do not present your members as to, sin, uh, 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 to sin as instruments to be used for unrighteousness. But present yourself to God as those who are alive from the dead 
and your members to God as instruments to be used for righteousness. For sin will, not, will have no mastery over you because you are not under law but under, under grace. So here's a Christian being told, don't give yourself to sin. So you will know, because you've been in the game, game long enough, that a Christian can sin. It doesn't mean from the day you are first saved, suddenly everything becomes wonderful. Um, gravity has a habit of pulling you back down again, as you will know, as we all know. Go to Romans 7. This is the most driven Christian you will read about in the Bible, the Apostle Paul, who, if you think about it, he was beaten, he gave his life for Christianity, and yet he can write this, Romans 7, and it's 18. For I know that no, nothing good lives in me that is in my flesh. For I want to do good, but I cannot do it. For I do, for I do not do the good I want, but I do do the evil that I do not want to. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer me doing it, but sin that lives in me. So I find in the law that when I want to do good, evil is present within me. For I delight in the law of God and in the inner, in the inner being, but I see a different law working in my members, waging war um, against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from the body of this death? This is the Apostle Paul. Mm. <laughs> yeah. 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 Even to the, the most just and upright Pharisee, if you like, is, you know, good. And at one stage, um, Paul says that I, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisee. I was found guiltless under the law. I have all these things in my favour, but yeah, they're, they're junk. They're garbage. They're rubbish. They're rubbish. In fact, I've probably written that down later on. I've probably ruined it now. Let's go to Romans 8, because we're there. Let's get to the top of a mountain, shall we? Four, first four verses. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of uh, for the for the law of life giving spirit in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For God achieved what the law could not do. In it, it was weak through the flesh by sending him, by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He condemned sin and condemned um, sin in the flesh so that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled by those who walk according, not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. God can't affirm us in our life. He will come to us. There's that old, lovely old song, Jesus, take me as I am, I can come no other way. You sung that one? Yeah. Yeah. Jesus went to the prostitutes and the sinners, to the lepers, to the outcasts, but he didn't affirm them. What did he say to the woman caught in adultery? Just go and sin no more. And he can't say to us, I affirm you, you're a good guy, Stephen, you're wonderful, you're amazing. Just carry on just as you are. Uh-oh. No. We plateau in our lives. We will go up a bit and then we'll walk for a while. Then we'll plateau a bit and we'll go up and we'll plateau. I think of it like this. Say I've, I'm climbing up a mountain and I've got about 10 foot up this mountain and I stop on a ledge. And I look down and there's someone five foot below me. Ha! You're down below me. Ha ha! I'm better than you. The summit's 20,000 feet that way. We will never reach the summit of this mountain in our life. And it's not until God comes and takes us up to perfection. It's what's called sanctification in the Bible. The idea is that we're justified when we believe. 
God forgives our sin. But during our life we are sanctified. He makes us more like him. The teachings of God into Jesus. The teachings of Jesus, his character through the apostles to us. And it comes into us. It's his life coming into us. It's his blood. It's his flesh. It's his character. And we're supposed to be changing. So here you have a church that is devoting itself to that teaching. It's not surprising that people were being added to it. When you have that, and every new denomination that sets itself up, it goes back to that, and it starts with the teachings of Jesus. It doesn't start with the traditions of the church. It doesn't start with the, this is what the bishop or the pope says, this is what the priest says. It starts, this is what Jesus said. This is what God said through Jesus. That's why this is so important. And you cannot force it onto anybody. They cannot make people follow it. They have to devote themselves to it. It's something you have to do. Not something I can make you do. Something I, I can't make anybody else do it. Nobody else can make me do it. I have to devote myself to God, to his teachings, to his life. Let's go straight to 1 Corinthians. I'm going to miss some of those. There's a lot in here in Timothy that I should be looking at and I've run over time already. There's a word there, godliness. Godliness. Actually, let's go to 2 Peter first. Let's go to 2 Peter. I've got to see that one. I've got to go to 2 Peter. Sorry. Have I got it down as Timothy? Are you right? Well, go to 2 Peter first. 2 Peter 1. Yeah, 2 Peter 1. It's a too, important, too important a story to miss. That picture there, above it you've got some slaves working away. Who are you slave to? Are you a slave to God? Or are you a slave to man? Are you a slave to your own nature? Down below you've got Peter at the, um, in the garden outside uh, Caiaphas' house. When people come up to him and said, you're one of his disciples, aren't you? No, not me, mate. You're one of his disciples, not me. Not, you're one of his disciples, we've seen you. I don't even know, effing know the man. Which is effectively what he said. And he failed. He promised he would give his life for Jesus. And he failed. Later on, Jesus, after the resurrection by the Sea of Galilee, says, Jesus, oh, Peter, do you love me? That being the word agape. Peter says to him, Lord, you know I am your friend. The word Philip, of, of, um, um, Philadelphia, I think it is. Yes. Are, you my, are you my friend? Jesus says, okay, feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? No, I'm your friend. Or, I, you know I'm your friend. Eventually Jesus comes and says, Peter, are you my friend? Are you really my friend? And that's when Peter burst into tears. Jesus knew where he was. Well, Jesus knew where he was. At the Last Supper he knew where he was. But he knew where he wanted him to be. He wanted him to be where the love is. So let's go to 2 Peter. Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ to those who through the righteousness of our God and Saviour Jesus Christ have been granted a faith just as precious as ours. May grace and peace be lavished upon you as you grow in riches of knowledge of God, of Jesus our Lord. I can pray this because his divine power has bestowed on us everything necessary for life and for godliness through the riches of knowledge. For the one who called us by his own glory and excellence, through these things he has bestowed on us his precious and most magnificent promise, so that by means of, that, of, of what was promised, you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped the worldly corruption that is produced by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith, excellence, and to your excellence, knowledge, to your knowledge, self-control, to your self-control, perseverance, to your perseverance, godliness, to your godliness, brotherly affection, to your brotherly affection, unselfish love it's a stage 
he failed to make the standing jump from where he was to love. But here in the later part of his life, he said, I had to work through these stages. I had to work up by ledge, by ledge, by ledge, by ledge to reach agape love, unselfish, godly love. And the word godliness is in there. It's not a very popular word in Christianity nowadays. It's only used in the Bible by two people, by Peter in Timothy and Titus, and by, uh, by, sorry, by Paul in Timothy and Titus, and by Peter in his apostles. His two letters. Godliness. The idea that your life becomes a reflection of the character and personality of God. And Peter in his teaching, or Paul in his teaching talks about it. And he comes up, he says that the ultimate end of this teaching is love. It's agape. Let's read that. So it's 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians what his description of love is. And think of a church that shows this, this ultimate form of godliness. This is 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak with the tongue of men and angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy or clanging symbol. If I have prophecy, I know all mysteries and all knowledge, but do, uh, and I have all faith, so as I can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away everything I own, and if I um, give my body over to, um, in order to boost, um, to boast, but do not have love, I receive no benefit. Love is patient. Love is kind. Is not envious. Love does not brag. It is not puffed up. It is not rude. It is not self-serving. It is not easily angered or resentful. It is, not, it is not glad about injustice, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but where there is prophecy it will be set aside. If there are tongues they will cease. If there is knowledge it will be set aside. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when we are perfect, the practical will be set aside. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became an adult, I set aside childish things. From now on, we see it in a mirror indirectly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I have been fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope and love, but the greatest of these is love. That's what the teaching of the apostles, which was the teaching of Jesus, which was the teaching of God the Father, leads to. That's the ultimate teaching. If you want to affirm something, that's affirmation. And we're nowhere near. We're nowhere near. But that is what our churches should be aiming for. I'll quickly go over the last bits in the last days. There's a section there in 2 Timothy where Paul speaks that they, in the last days they will have a form of godliness but without the power. So it looks like godliness but God's not in it. If we look at our churches at the moment there's a form of godliness, they can walk around with robes and but is the power of God in there? Is that love of God in there? If we're affirming sin in ourselves and in others, it's Jesus, undermining the whole thing. Yeah. Jesus is love. Yeah, one of the sayings in the LGBT movement is love is love, which even a lot of lot of them think is rubbish. There are different types of love. And if we say, yes, you are perfect, then we're not showing them love. No. Because we're not showing them the truth. And if you lie to people, you're not telling them the truth. No. And that's not love. No. And the same with our churches. If our teaching in there is not bringing us closer to the character and personality of Jesus, then it's a waste of time. In Hebrews, 
Um, I think it's in Hebrews. We won't look it up, but it talks about um, people on whom the teaching of, G or teaching of God has fallen, and yet nothing's come up. And it's like rain falling on the land. And if rain falls on the land and crops come up, it's a blessing. But if rain falls on the land and only weeds come up, then it's a cursing for burning. And it's talking about the teachings there. And it's talking about that God has brought his teaching, he's brought his word on someone's life. And if we don't see fruit, if we only see weeds, then it's going to be burnt. Remember the fig tree? Or the... Uh, the um, fig tree that the master said to him yeah. the master said to the, the vine dresser well why is it cumbering the ground and he said give us another year if it doesn't do anything rip it up mm. think of the parable of the sower the seed that falls on the ground <clears throat> it's the seed that grows and brings faith that is worthy the rest of it is a waste of time let's go straight to one that's not on there Two Titus, or oh, sorry, Titus, chapter 2. I looked at my phone this morning and it sent me a Bible verse. And it fitted in perfectly, so I will finish on this because I'm overshot badly already. So Titus, chapter 2. And this sums up everything, really. And it's 11 to 12. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to peoples. It trains us to reject godless ways and worldly desires and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age. As we wait for the happy fulfilment of the hope of the glorious appearing of the great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. A church that devotes itself to learning about the character and personality of Jesus will grow, even in the age we are at. There will be people who are being saved. You know, there's people who are being saved, Palestinians who are being saved in Gaza, who are coming to Jesus in Gaza at the moment. Even in that horrible situation they have backed themselves into. There are people being saved around the world there are atheists coming back to Jesus for the first time after having spent years saying that he doesn't exist. And as the world gets worse, and it will be getting worse, people will be coming back. And if they see in us and in our church the character, the personality of God and of Jesus, then God will add to this church day by day those who he calls to be saved. Let's finish with a word of prayer. Father, we cannot see your face, but we can see Jesus' face. And in him we see the fullness of your character and your personality. Lord, help us to live on his words. May his life flow in our veins. Lord, teach us your ways. Lead us in your your way that you want us to go. Lord, and when we do that, you will work. Lord, help us to set our faces towards you and not towards the wall. This church in this country is dying. But you have a work to be done that doesn't rely on bricks and mortar, that doesn't rely on organisations. You took 12 peasants and you changed the world. Father, be with us and help us. Help us to know you. The power of your resurrection, the fellowship of your suffering, you made conformable to the likeness of your death. Amen. Amen. And Amen. Thank you, Thank you all. Sorry I've gone on too late again. You can look up all the other... Uh
the other verses. I, I particularly like the one in the old, the authorised. It says that the, they will look for teachers who will tickle their ears. I like that one. It's not in the new versions. It's quite boring, really. Dad, should I turn it off? Yes, please turn it off. Okay. <laughs>